No country on earth could allow 7 million people in the history of the world, could allow 7 million people to come in within three years and have any sense of who these people are or what they're doing or what services they're taking from people or what their intentions are. Can they mesh with us culturally and everything else? Like everyone should be a hawk on the border at this very moment because of what Biden has yes. done. I would also say for the health of our democracy, if, if, if your viewers are thinking right now, whether they love Trump or not or whatever, if they're thinking something's wrong, meaning we're gonna do what we just did four years ago, like this is what we've been left with, two guys who are four years older and we're about to do that again. If you think something's wrong, then you might want to at least put a little verbal support or a little excitement behind Kennedy, just because maybe it will help break up this system that we clearly know is not representative of a huge swath of the population. All right, happy Friday. I'm excited for the weekend. I don't know about you, especially coming off such a nice Easter weekend previously. This is nice. We're into the springtime, at least here in uh, in the mid-Atlantic region. Big show for you today. Trump is expected to raise well over $40 million at Mar-a-Lago tonight. Not a bad haul considering $26 million was such a big deal at Radio City Music Hall with three presidents and a bunch of liberal, well, just liberals. Anyway, uh, plus, RFK was on Dave Rubin's show. He's going to join us in a minute. And I want to ask Dave his impressions of RFK, uh, whether he thinks he can actually pull this thing out. I want to tell you, though, before we get into it with Dave Rubin, about two of the great sponsors that help keep this show free. That's why you should subscribe right now. YouTube, Spotify, Apple, Rumble. It's free. Just hit that subscription and notification button. And these sponsors help make it all possible. When you lose power, and I'm talking an hour, maybe a week, maybe a month, maybe two months, are you going to be ready? I know I am. In my house, I have a Patriot Power Generator 2000X. And if you go to fourpatriots.com slash Spicer, you can get one too. Here's what I love about it. You can literally bring it inside your house. There are no fumes and no noise. It powers completely off the solar panels that come with it. You can power your refrigerator, medical devices, phones, computers, all of your family's needs. There are four outlets plus USB outlets. All of that comes with it. The greatest thing about it, as I said, is there's no cords coming in and out of your house, no gas to refill. It all powers off of those free solar panels that come with it. So you will be ready in a time of crisis to take care of you and your family. And if something else happens down the road, you can take the Patriot Power Generator 2000X, put it in your car, bring it to a friend, a family member's house, and set it up easily just for them. Again, it's all powered off of these solar panels that come free with it. So go to fourpatriots.com slash Spicer to make sure that you will be ready in a time of crisis. Animal lovers, if you've watched the show before, you know about my friends at Delta Rescue. If you can go to deltarescue.org right now and check out the videos of all the great work that they do. You've probably heard me talk about my friend Leo Grillo. Leo founded Delta Rescue because he thought and knew there was a need for animals, horses, dogs, cats that were malnourished, that weren't getting the veterinary care that they needed, that needed a place to roam freely. Now, you know that shelters take in animals all over the place. You probably have one in your town. But Delta Rescue is different. Delta Rescue is a lifelong sanctuary. This is a no-kill sanctuary. They can go there, get the care and the support they need for life. And if you go to DeltaRescue.org, like I said, you can go and look at the videos of how amazing this facility is that Leo Grillo has set up. But he started after just rescuing one dog, a Doberman, and realized, I have a lifelong mission to complete now. So it relies entirely on our donations. That, that's what keeps it going. So please go there and think about a donation. But more importantly, if you go to the website, DeltaRescue.org, you'll see the estate planning kit. And that's really what I want you to think about. Can you make Delta Rescue part of your estate so that Leo's mission of caring for these animals is enduring well past him, well past me, well past all of us. Go to deltarescue.org, download that estate planning kit and think about making it part of your estate. Dave, welcome back to the show. Always good to see you. Sean, how you doing, man? Well, I'd say I'm great. I had a little dental work this morning, so I, I, I'm not uh -oh. sure I'm, I'm fantastic, but I'll let you do most of the talking. Um, speaking of doing all the talking, you had um, RFK on your show this week. I was, I'm fascinated by just in general, what, what's your takeaway about him as a candidate in general? Let's just start there. Sure, so let's put aside issues for a moment, and I'm happy to discuss the <laughs> issues and his specific issues if you want to. 
But as a candidate, the, the thing that I was really trying to nail down in that hour was what is the path? Right. You may be right about all of the COVID stuff. You may be right about the deep state and the swamp and all of these things that I think attract a lot of people from both the left and the right. That may all well be true. I think a lot of it is, obviously. But what is the path here? Uh, and he did lay out, there's a couple of things happening. He's going to make some big announcements, I think, starting next week. But basically, uh, two states per week for the next 20 weeks will be announced that he's on the ballot. That at least is their intention, as he explained it to me. That gets you to about 40 states. Now, obviously, you need all 50 and you need D.C., uh, but they believe they are going to get on all of them. And to me, that's the first hurdle. I think what he's having, if we're to believe there's any chance here, and maybe there isn't, maybe our two, you know, two party thing is just so calcified. There's simply no chance even for a guy with the last name of Kennedy. But if there is a chance and there's an awful lot of disaffected ex Dems that are interested in him, there's a lot of people on the right who are really pissed about COVID that feel that Trump has not just sort of had a mea culpa about it. So there is a ba there is a group there that likes this guy. But what they need to see is that, oh, there's actually a chance. It's not just, oh, I like the guy and I'm, I'm going to throw my vote away. Uh, it's more like, oh, there's a chance that he can do it and I can get behind it because it might actually happen. So that, I think, is the most important thing with him. Uh, in terms of, you know, little differences I have with him on, say, abortion or maybe his feelings about climate change or things like that, I just don't think those things matter. He is an old school liberal uh, who I personally have a lot in common with. And whether we agree on every little issue, his love of the country and the way he wants to set this thing right. And by the way, the fact that he doesn't just talk about politics. When I asked him what are the most important issues to you, uh, he brings up health first, meaning health of the nation, the way we're being poisoned by big pharma and by all of the processed foods we eat and what we're doing to the soil and the water, like stuff that, that Joe Biden and Donald Trump would never touch. So that in and of itself is interesting. And, uh, you know, we'll see about the ballot access because that truly is what it all right. comes down to. Yeah, exactly. I tell people all the time, if you can get, get 35, 40%, but if he's not on a ballot and you can't vote for him, it doesn't matter. When, exactly. when you, he was in studio with you. What did you, did you, you know, there's a big difference, I think, when somebody's doing what we're doing, which is over, you know, uh, cameras versus in person. Did, did, did you find that he's a charming person or a yeah. warm person? He's thoughtful. That's that's the main thing with him. He's thoughtful and he's actually answering your questions when you sit across him. You know what it's like. Sometimes you do these in person and you can you can't even when you're in person, you can't quite read the person properly or you ask them a question. They just give you the canned answer or whatever else. I actually had lunch with him before the interview with about 10 other people, some of my staff, some of his staff and a couple uh, a couple donors. And when everyone went around the table, just introducing themselves, asking them things, you could see he was actually listening to them. He pauses for a moment before he responds. He doesn't just go to the canned answer. So again, whether, whether you agree with the guy on everything or not, there is a clear love of country and not only a love of country, let's, let's keep in mind his, the Kennedy name was as synonymous with the Democrat party as anything else. I don't know that there's anything else more synonymous with it, even more than Clinton and Obama. And he has been expelled in essence. He left the Democrat party, but it's really because they pushed him out. And I said to him yesterday, uh, something that I said the day he announced his candidacy, uh, I said on my show that by the end of this, uh, I don't know that he'll be a Republican, but he will not be a Democrat. And I said that to him yesterday and, and he laughed and he said, I, I probably should have seen that a little bit sooner. Did, um, the, you know, the thing that's interesting to me, I agree with you. The first step is the ballot access. And then you go, okay, I mean, I feel like we're back with Nikki Haley. Tell me your path. How are you going to win? And, and he can get to 15, 20% in some states. I've seen him as high as low twenties, but when you talk to him about a path, does he talk, does he create a path to 270? Does he say, I can win Utah, I could win Massachusetts? Or is he just now saying, I just need to get on the ballot? Because I think that we, we talk about two hurdles, ballot access yeah. and then winning. And I feel like that's not like going down a track where you're like, hey, just get over those two hurdles in front of you. And, you know, if you work out long enough, you can get over them. Those are major hurdles in themselves. Uh, the first one, the ballot access, it seems like he's chipping it away at, but then the second, hurdle is even bigger. It's now you got to win the state. Does he, right. I, I just don't see 
Like, I feel like it's like Nikki Haley redo, where it's just like, she's like, well, we'll have to see how we do. And we have to do better than before. And it's like, nope, that actually doesn't, that's not how you win. Yeah, I think he could probably, I, I don't want to speak for him or, or the campaign, obviously, but I think he can make probably a more compelling case than Nikki could make. Nikki, nobody else could figure it out beyond Nikki. She was just kind of <laughs> running with the hope that Trump maybe was going to, you know, trip and, and break his hip, something like that. That was it. There wasn't like this huge support for her. The numbers didn't bear it out or anything else. Let's let's pretend for a second that he gets the ballot access, right? If he gets the ballot access, then you have to look at like, who are the h- hardcore supporters for Trump and for Biden? Now, I'm just roughly, I'm going to ballpark numbers here. And if you think that I'm wrong, please, please correct me. I think that Trump probably has the hardcore, like ride or try, ride or die. I think that's probably about 30% of the country. And then at this point, it's a little harder to tell with Biden, but I think probably about 30% of the country is hardcore Joe Biden, meaning that they're going to vote Democrat no matter what. Biden is just the, you know, the avatar that they put there. Okay, so that's about 60% of the country. That means about 40% of the country is up in the air. And most of those people, if, if Kennedy doesn't, make a mark are going to obviously go one way or another. But if he does run, well, let's say that if there's a pool of 40 and the other guys are getting 30 each and you can get close to 30, you're right in there with them. Now, I get it. That's that's a moonshot to some extent, just the way our two party system works. But I don't think it's I just don't think it's completely insane. And I would also say for the health of our democracy, if 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 your viewers are thinking right now, whether they love Trump or not or whatever, if they're thinking something's wrong, meaning we're going to do what we just did four years ago, like this is what we've been left with, two guys who are four years older and we're about to do that again. If you think something's wrong, then you might want to at least put a little verbal support or a little excitement behind Kennedy, be- whether he becomes the nominee or not, or, or gets on all the ballots or not, just because maybe it will help break up this system that we clearly know is not representative of a huge swath of the population. Um, there's been a there was a story out in one of the Main Street outlets earlier this week that said, well, while Kennedy was running in the Democratic primary, conservatives loved him. You know, Charlie Kirk, Benny Johnson, <laughs> everybody was having him yeah. on talking about yeah, how great yeah. he is. The second he became an independent, they were like, he sucks. He's horrible. And it's just interesting because I feel like the thing that I find fascinating is folks on the right, the influencer types uh, have soured on him. But the Biden campaign clearly thinks he's a threat. They they are putting money on him. And, and that, to me, is how you know who's he, who he's affecting. Like the Trump campaign is just literally, I think Donald Trump truthed out, welcome to the race, Bobby, love to have you, whatever. And, and it was very like welcoming and saying that he's Biden's opponent, not his. The Biden campaign is putting their money where their mouth is. They clearly are scared of him. That shows me that that he actually poses a bigger threat to, to Biden, at least now, than Trump. Sean, the, the type of people that I'm always focused on on my show, or at least, especially in these last six months, are the disaffected liberals. These people who are old school liberals who have woken up to the radicalization of the Dem party. If you are, I'm just using a few examples here. If you're a Bill Maher, if you're a Barry Weiss, if you're a Coleman Hughes, uh, who was on The View last week and is, is kind of hot yeah. right now. If you're anyone that holds truly liberal principles, the same principles that John F. Kennedy Jr. held, then to me, you would be more in line with Donald Trump than you would be with the modern Democrats. However, a huge percentage of those people will just simply never vote for Donald Trump. Bill Maher is never going to vote for Donald <laughs> Trump. I can't, I can't speak to those other people, but I don't mean to make it about them three specifically. It's about the type of people who think like that. That's where Kennedy can grab people. So it's like, I could see if you're Joe Biden right now, why you'd be really worried because suddenly you go, boy, if this guy does get a decent amount of ballot access and then he gets 10% of the vote. Well, keep in mind, Sean, the Libertarian Party, which is on all, has all full access, meaning 50 plus DC, they, they've been getting about one to 2% the last couple of elections. Kennedy can definitely get more than that. And we know how razor close our elections are. So he definitely could affect the election. However, I would I would just say one other thing, which is that I'm not so convinced it will be more liberals than people leaving Trump, because I'm just telling you, don't forget about the covid thing. There are an awful lot of people. Maybe it's not the influencer crew who want to be liked by Trump, but there's an awful lot of people on the right who are pissed at Trump still 
over the COVID thing. And uh, w- whether that's rightly or wrongly, you know, they're pissed that he hasn't said that Operation Warp Speed wasn't great yes. or whatever it might be. And and he's going to lose some to him too. So I don't know that that fully is a 50-50 proposition. So yesterday on our panel discussion, all three folks, former Congressman Doug Collins, um, they all, you know, include, you know, he's a former elected official. I mean, every one of them agreed that what tipped the scales for them in terms of actually giving Kennedy any kind of credence as, as a, I don't know if I want to call it a moderate because that's not the words that they use. But when he chose Nicole Shanahan as his VP, a dyed in the wool far left progressive person, that yeah. they said that was it. That's when they said, okay, we're not even like he's done. Yeah. And I think that Kennedy, and I think it was Doug Collins that made the case that if you're, that Kennedy made a, a choice with that. Now, I'm not a big believer in VPs, but I will say that they send a signal to what you care about and what, where you need to sort of augment your, your, your campaign, if you will. And I think that he looks at the Michigans, the, the non-committed vote in a lot of these things and says, okay, if I can show, if I can send the bat signal up to the folks on the left that I'm serious about these progressive views, I'm a Kennedy, I love the environment, I am anti-choice, you know, anti-pro-life and all this stuff, uh, then that will show them, and I got this young tech uh, type progressive, then, then that'll be the big signal that I, I'm really going after that vote. And that's where I think I agree with you on the COVID stuff. And I think if he had gotten a Tulsi Gabbard or something, yeah. we, I would have been going, oh gosh, I don't know how this thing ultimately shakes out. But I think he alienated so many people with that pick that he clearly, and, and I think the Biden folks clearly get it. That this is a guy who is challenging you know, if you had to say of 10 voters, kind of the point that, it, you know, if you just hypothetically said of every 10 voters that he's going to get, I think it's seven to three or eight to two liberals versus Trump voters. Well, I, you know, unfortunately we had, we only had an hour and I didn't <laughs> get into the VP stuff with him, but I think, I think that your prescription there is, is pretty on point uh, because it, it doesn't fully make sense to tick to the left in this case, if you're him, like you're trying to bring in these disaffected liberals, the people that are you. So why bring in a, 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 you know, a rich tech billionaire who's donated to a lot of the causes in the San Francisco area, you know, some of the anti-police stuff and and all that stuff. In that sense, it doesn't make sense. It makes sense in another sense that she has a ton of money. That is something and you do need money. So, okay, fine. Maybe there's some self-funding there. Um, but you mentioned another name that I think would have been the right choice, uh, Tulsi Gabbard. From what I understand, I mean, I've read a couple articles about it. He didn't say anything to me uh, about this. It sounds like she might have said no to him, that at least there was like a general conversation being had there. Uh, Tulsi, it seems to me, is more open to the Trump situation, which if she goes with Trump, I think that is absolutely spectacular. And it's a oh. it's a it's a wonderful sign to me to grab some of those liberals who are nervous about Trump and bring them over to the Trump side. Um, I get why maybe the most conservative person on the planet wouldn't be for that. That's fine. Um but that that would have been the move, I think, uh, for RFK if he had wanted to generate the most energy, sort of holistic policy and energy. Tulsi was probably the one person that could have delivered that. I, I, I think that here's what I'll agree with you. First of all, I, I just I, I think she would not be helpful to, to the Trump ticket. Ultimately, that being said, uh, I think that she looked at RFK and said, I don't see a path forward for you. And that, I don't that might be right. Yeah, yeah I, I mean, I think that that's it. She said, I'd rather take low chances with Donald Trump than a guaranteed loss with you. Uh, that That's my what, take on it. Why do you think she wouldn't be helpful to Trump? Because to me, it seems like I think a lot, you know, Trump, what he needs to do now is find some new voters from last time, right? So if he needs to bring around sort of middle-aged, middle-class women, uh, they might be willing to vote for a young woman who serves, currently serves in the yep. military, who's a little more liberal on, say, abortion and guns. But uh, see, that's who, it. See, but but yeah. that's it. You just put your finger on it. That at the end of the day, Trump, the MAGA movement, 
I think is with Trump almost 100% every day of the week. But when you start, I mean, there's a reason that Trump appointed the judges he did. There's a reason that he's aligned himself with the NRA. He's a smart tactician of politics. And he understands that when it comes to the conservative and the Republican base, there are two basically third rails, abortion and standing for standing for life. And two is guns. And, and you're absolutely right. You touched on it. Yes, she is. The, the, the delegates of the convention would have gone nuts. And I think that Trump understands that, that, that there's a reason he chose Mike Pence. There's a reason that he appointed the judges that he did. There's a reason that he stands with the NRA because he gets how critical that is to the base. And I, 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 I get it. Every time Trump pushes the envelope with MAGA, they stick with him on those two issues. I, I think that as much as she might bring with them, I'd wonder how many people would sit on their hands. That, well, that remains to be seen. So we'll, <laughs> we'll see if he, if he, if he doesn't choose her, you're probably exactly right. And if he does, we'll see if the base then peels off a little bit. My suspicion is he could bring on uh, reincarnated Jimmy Carter. Well, he's alive still, but uh, he could bring on, you know, literally anybody and they will suck it up. So I, I, that's why I'm with you. Like I'm saying, you're absolutely right. Yeah. This is such an untested yeah. Uh, yeah. hypothesis, but and, and, you know, enough people have sucked it up over and over again on things that he said, done, et cetera. So I get it. He, he defies all political, uh, truths when it comes to historical norms. Right. But, but exactly. I, I, I think the other thing that I thought was fascinating this week was we, you were mentioning RFK and, and the libertarians. And I have been on this bandwagon since the beginning of the cycle. If you go back, you look at the biggest difference between 2016 and 2020 in key battleground states. It's the strength of the third parties, particularly the Green Party. Jill Stein did very, very well. 50,000 votes in Michigan. Trump only won by 10,000. She was very strong in Pennsylvania, Georgia, all these states. She didn't do, she wasn't on the ballot as the Green Party nominee in 2020, and that's where they suffered. Michigan, I think she got a thousand votes, or the Green Party got a thousand votes in Michigan. The key this time, right, is who's got ballot access. Well, the Green Party has it in most of the states, and RFK is chipped away so far. Nevada, he's got there. He's got uh, North Carolina, according to him, this week in the in the seven to eight battleground states. That's important. But here's the big thing. I was truly worried about no labels because they made it clear that they wanted to do everything to stop Trump. How were they going to do that? They were going to find a, a Larry Hogan, a John Huntsman, a Chris Christie, a Nikki Haley, somebody to put at the top of that ticket, of that unity ticket, uh, to basically try to siphon off votes for Trump. When they announced this week that they are not, they are dropping their effort. And they had bad, they had ballot access in, in well over 25 states. That to me, was a huge, huge loss for Joe Biden and a huge plus for Trump. Because at best, I think you can argue that Kennedy, even on a good day, is, you know, six to four Biden to Trump. The Green Party candidate, Jill Stein's back on the ballot. And then I don't know how many ballots Kanye is going to be on, but again, <laughs> one or two. But my point is this, that everything yeah. right now in the third party world is not favoring Biden and it helps Trump. Well, think about how sad it is, like putting aside, I mean, you worked for Trump, uh, you know, like putting aside what you think about Donald Trump, how pathetic is it that the libertarians at this very moment, when, when clearly a huge percentage of the country does not like Biden and a huge percentage of the country does not like Trump, that they have not been able to find somebody to coalesce around, somebody to just get out there and be a little funky and different and weird, not necessarily somebody straight up from politics. Um, I don't know if the negotiations between Kennedy and them have completely fallen apart or what, and that's why they're trying to get access elsewhere. Um, but to me, if you were the Libertarian Party, you should have handed Kennedy the, the, key, the keys to the castle. Kennedy, we get it. You're not a pure Libertarian because, you know, you want to do stuff with the EPA as it relates to climate change and, and a series of other things. But you love America. We love America. You believe in the founding documents. We are going to go all in on you. The ballot access issue that we've spent a decent amount of time talking about here would not even be uh, important to talk about. And then we'd be talking about a real three-party race. So to me, whatever is going on in that Libertarian Party, and I, I've spent a lot of time around Libertarians, and they like arguing about whether we should have driver's licenses or not. It's like, man, you guys <laughs> had such a free... And I guess you still have the window because you're still on the, the ballots. Pick somebody decent for the sake. It would be good for America, if nothing else. 
All right, gentlemen, are you the same man you were 10 years ago? I know I can answer that question pretty honestly. We've probably lost a little bit of muscle, a little bit of energy, and definitely a little bit of testosterone. Our friends at Nugenics Total T, though, have a brand new product out with testosterone boosters that has Tesnor in it. This will help us turn back the clock, give us more energy, give us more ways to build that muscle back, and give us more testosterone. Uh, there's nothing to lose if you want to try it. That's the best part about this. Get your complimentary sample when you text 231231 and enter the code word SPICER. 231231, keyword SPICER. Nugenics Total T Power Booster is backed by clinical studies and it's real science. Its key ingredients have been shown to boost free testosterone levels in men. In other words, this is the science talking. This is what we're talking about. Don't be misled. Many products uh, use generic ingredients and aren't close to the clinical grade that you get in Nugenics Total Tea. So get a complimentary bottle when you text 231 231. Enter that keyword Spicer. Get a bottle of Nugenics Thermo X complimentary as well. That will help you burn fat. It's a fat incinerator. It's amazing. Text 231231, enter keyword SPICER. Texting enrolls you in automated text messages. Consent not required to purchase. Message and data rates may apply. It is the number one recommended brand by primary care physicians based on an independent survey conducted by IQVIA 2022. You know, you look at the Green Party, right? As I mentioned, Jill Stein in 2016, notched some some decent amount of votes. 2020, they don't put her on the ballot and they get crushed. And, and the thing that people have to understand about third parties is in many states, if you don't get a certain percentage of the vote, right. you get pushed down to minor party status and you go back to zero. So that it's important for them to do this. I don't, I just don't think the libertarians they're so used to being in oblivion that they don't think about things in terms of winning. It's it's like yeah. they'd rather have purity and this is what they get. Uh, um, I mean, look, I'm as someone who doesn't, I, I believe that that would literally hurt Trump and we'd end up with another four years of Biden. I, I'm happy for that, uh, that they don't put someone. It's one thing if you put up a right. real uh, look, candidate. I agree with that. I, I, I'm with you on that. It would hurt if, if, if it was a sane libertarian or someone on that ticket, be it Kennedy or someone else, it hurts Trump more. I, right. I accept that. I agree with you. I'm just talking about purely, I'm not talking about like granular politics level. I'm just talking about like, if you were just someone who is libertarian minded or just for the overall, I'm sort of having like a meta conversation about the overall health of the country. If we want some more voices to help break us out of this thing that we all know is kind of not right, then how is it that the libertarians right now have not found somebody? It's just, it's just crazy. Find any, find someone who can fund it themselves Mark Cuban, he's not a he's not a libertarian, and he's more right. on the left, obviously. But I'm just coming up with a name. Anybody. No, no, it's it's like it's like when Mike Bloomberg ran for mayor of New York. I always say, like people go, oh, he was a Republican. I was like, no, no, he rented the Republican Party. Yeah, exactly. He was exactly. he was like, get me in, and then I'm out. You know, you you brought up how Tulsi would help potentially address the issue of abortion, et cetera, et cetera. The, the Democrats have clearly gone all in. That's their issue this cycle. They they got the issue of abortion on the ballot in Florida. I still think that Florida is safe enough, but the question I, I the, the, the concern I have right now is I think Republicans after 2022 bungled the issue of abortion so bad. And I get why the Democrats are doing it. They may not yep. actually think yep. they're going to win Florida, but they want to scare you enough to say, keep an eye on your own backyard for right now. I, I think that, that this party, this movement better get a better answer. And I know Trump said at the beginning of the week, I think I'll have an answer for you next week. Now, whether he really does or not, I think he wants to have an answer soon. And he's going to say 15 or 16 weeks. I, I got to tell you, I think that like we, we spent five decades on the pro-life movement saying it's a state's right issue. And right, now we're going right. to come out saying, oh, we want a 15 week ban. I just, I, I, I go, can we screw this up anymore? You're, you're completely right. And I cannot believe more Republicans aren't messaging this. I personally, Sean, I, I happen to believe what most sane people thought about abortion 20 uh, years ago, which is that it should be safe, but rare, or it should be rare, but safe, safe, but rare. And that, you know, we can whittle away whether it should be eight weeks or 12 weeks or 14 weeks, but that ultimately it's a state's rights decision because the reversal of Roe, all the reversal of Roe did was kick it back to the states because there's right. obviously no guaranteed constitutional right to an abortion. It's not in the constitution, so fine. So the idea now, the Republicans are so bad on this, you're so right. 
they're so bad on this that they've somehow created a situation where they're supposed to announce what they think a national abortion strategy would be. The whole point of the reversal, which was their biggest win in however long you want to look back. And now Trump's going to have to lay out some case that's going to make the base angry at him for 14 week abortion or something. It makes it makes no sense. But this is where the Democrats tend to be better political operatives than the Republicans. What Trump should be messaging out there is, hey, look, I put the justices on the Supreme Court that flipped Roe v. Wade. It's in the state's hands and that's where it's supposed to be. And and even and if he really wanted to say he could say, you know what, I personally believe it's 10, 10 weeks or whatever. That's where I'd be. But I leave it to the states because I leave, I believe in the Constitution of the United States. But it's not up to the president. Because even though it's not up to the president, the Democrats have convinced everybody it is. Yeah. So now Trump's about to fall into their trap. This one, it's incredible that this is unfolding right now. Not only it. not only fall into their trap, but I'll give Nikki Haley for bringing this up on the campaign trail. It's never going to pass anything. You need right. 60 well, votes the in the point. Senate. You need 60 votes in the Senate. There isn't a prayer under the best case scenario the Republicans aren't going to pick up 60, you know, what, 10, 11 seats. So they're not going to, it's not going to happen. And neither are the Dems, the way things shake out. So why are we creating an issue and creating the sense, to your point, the Democrats- But also, are, Sean, you as someone that's pro-life, would you even want it enshrined back in? It just got kicked back to the state. So now if the Republicans were like, no, we're going to enshrine 16 weeks, you'd uh, nationally, you'd be worse off than you were under- Right, Rome. no, no, so and that's- I, I, no I, I, right. Sense. And I agree. This the point is, is that we made a case that the court didn't have. There was nothing about abortion in the Constitution in the Fourteenth Amendment, and and now we're literally going six months later. Aha! The real plan was to actually do this, and I feel like we're screwing ourselves. And, and I mean, a there's like eighteen other arguments, but to your point, we're literally like, no, 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 no. Let me get in the way of the moving car. Let me go in the, the middle of the street. And I'm like, guys. What are you doing? This is the dumbest move ever politically. And and I think that we're handing the Democrats this. But the reason I brought this up is the Democrats put this on the ballot in Florida. And, and I think that we took a state that we had reliably started to move. And DeSantis did a great job as governor, showed how you can win the state even bigger, take it out of the purplish thing and give it more of a reddish tone in key areas, Hialeah, Miami, all these places where his actions spoke louder than words and people rewarded him electorally. And yet then we went, no, 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 no. Let me screw this up and stand in front of the moving car. And I feel like, you know, the idea of having to spend money in Florida is a complete and utter waste that will be self-inflicted. I'm not too worried uh, about Florida, despite this move. I I agree this is fallen into a trap by the Dems. Uh, I think that DeSantis, if he, if he made one error sort of gubernatorially, maybe you, we could probably do many errors as a candidate, let's say, but gubernatorially, if he made one error, uh, if the six week thing probably was a bit much because look, I live here in Florida. I've gone to every big Republican event for the last two and a half years of my life. I never once heard anyone complaining about our 15 week abortion ban. Never. People may have had their own private, personal, religious beliefs that it, sh- it should be illegal or six weeks or whatever, but that it just was not in the hierarchy of importance. It just was not in that top right. 10. It was not there. So he made a choice based on his own personal, private, religious, Catholic beliefs to get it to six weeks, the heartbeat bill. And he, and by the way, that's his right as the governor, he's elected, he can set the policy. So that's just fine. But I do think it was sort of electorally a mistake and it could cost the Republicans a bit in November because women, a certain set of pro-choice women will be so revved up. All of that being said, there are over a million more Republicans than Democrats now registered in the state of Florida. When DeSantis okay. came in, it, when DeSantis came in, it was 300,000 more Democrats than Republicans. So I'm not worried that Florida is going to go the other way because of this, but I agree. It's just, it's just giving fodder in a situation that, man, you had the beast basically starve the Democrat beast of Florida. There is no functioning party here. And then you kind of resuscitated it just yes. when you could have officially, you know, buried its bones. You know, I, I said this the other day on one of the other shows, like DeSantis this week took on squatters. Um, he did the whole thing on social media. And I'm like, where was this guy running for president? Because it's like as governor, he just keeps hitting home runs and he runs for president and he can't actually crack the ball. 
Yeah, you know, it's. I think that there was one issue they could not solve, and that was the Trump issue. Yeah. I, I think that you know, in retrospect, if you look back, you know, when sh- Trump announced very early on, it was before all the court the court cases. Yeah. There was not a lot of energy there, and you have to remember at that time, DeSantis was riding high because we were still in the aftermath of COVID, and he was kind of the king as it relates yeah. to that. So he saw the chance, he went for it. It didn't work out. But I got to tell you, Sean, you know, I was as big a, a DeSantis guy, and I still am. That's out there. I am very happy he is the governor of my state right now. I, the, the the country might be terminal, but the state is not. Right. I I I I I think he is the example. Like he takes on issues, he fights for what's right, he gets things done. I I, I hope more governors would would take that on. I want to sort of switch gears on the the fighting because the other big fight that's happening in Washington is before we left, or before we, I'm not there, before Congress <laughs> left. Um, yeah. They, Marjorie Taylor Greene filed this motion to vacate and I had her on the show and I was asking her about it and I get her disappointment. I get the concern about the border. This is my biggest issue. I, it is a national security issue. It is a health issue. It's a women issue. It's a child issue. And I think the Republicans blow this bigger than they do abortion. Uh, in terms of not realizing how they can, I mean, this is the opposite. Democrats have abortion. Republicans have the border and they know the Democrats know how to take it and utilize that issue to get votes and win. We're sitting around going, well, gosh, we got this huge gift. Let's figure out how to stare at it and wonder what to do. I get Marjorie Taylor Greene's like, issues with Johnson, that he should fight harder, that he should, that's the hill to die on. But I, I just, I'm like, why are we constantly on the, on this side? It's always one fight after another. And I was like, I said to her, we have a two seat majority. And it's, and it's going to go down even further for a couple of months or a couple of weeks until we get some replacements brought in through that McCarthy seat, et cetera. Yeah. I just, I, I don't like at a time when we need to be focused from now until November, I feel like our side continues to just shoot at each other. Well, Sean, this was my concern when uh, Gates and a couple of the other people, but mainly Matt Gates, went to take out McCarthy because McCarthy had his problems. He obviously was a bit of a swamp creature, all of that stuff. But if you listen to uh, Thomas Massey and Chip Roy, who are basically the most conservative voters in all of Congress, Thomas Massey, who's a libertarian, really. I mean, these are the guys who vote constitution. They vote to cut budgets every time around. They have, you know, 99% you know, conservative ratings by virtually everybody. They both were backing McCarthy the whole time. And I talked to both of them. I had both of them on the show that week as it was all going down in DC. And both of them said, look, Gates is putting on a show here, but ultimately what McCarthy has done has started to rein in some of the nonsense, started to rein in some of the spending, tighten that purse, et cetera. So you may have thought that McCarthy, whatever, if there was a, people didn't like a certain affect with him or something, whatever it was, my thing always was, okay, so you put Mike Johnson in. I, Mike Johnson strikes me as a fairly uh, decent guy for a politician and he knows what he, I sense that he's, uh, he knows what he believes and things of that nature. Um, But my feeling was, I don't think it's going to suddenly get much better this way. Uh, Also because of the nature of how Gates had to do it by basically tag teaming with the Democrats to do it. You're, You're signing a deal with the devil. So I think that's where the Republicans are at right now. McCarthy was actually more decent they wanted to give him credit for. And now they're just getting someone who's somewhere in the orbit of McCarthy and they're, and Marjorie Taylor Greene's frustrated, but sorry, lady, that's politics. It's just how it is. But so, so that kind of goes into Johnson. There's this big issue. Obviously, Congress is out till I think next week. The, the big issue is this Ukraine funding, right? To which I can't, I get it. I'm sympathetic to what's happening over there. And, and I obviously do not want Russia to, to grow in power or in landmass or whatever. I want to stop them. I, I think what Putin is doing is wrong. I think I feel bad for the Ukrainian people and the battle that they're engaged in. But but I do think that there is a way a way to say, hey, great, why aren't we fighting for our border, our security, and and uh, frankly, you can do two things at once. Johnson announced well, though that he go ahead. Well, well, first off, I mean that's why everyone hates D.C. Right, the fact that they somehow combine these bills as right. if they have anything to do with each other. Of course, everyone hates D.C. because of that. Sean, I'm I'm probably more of a border hawk. I think we're probably pretty damn close now at this point. Uh, Every sane American should be a border hawk right now. Close the freaking border. Figure out what is going on. No country on earth 
could allow 7 million people in the history of the world, could allow 7 million people to come in within three years and have any sense of who these people are or what they're doing or what services they're taking from people or what their intentions are. Can they mesh with us culturally and everything else? Like everyone should be a hawk on the border at this very moment because of what Biden has yes. done. And if you dingbats in Congress can't do that alone, <laughs> having nothing to do see, with Ukraine, is- but this is can't. my point, they, though, yeah. is, is you have the director of the FBI, the director of national intelligence saying that it's a national security threat. You have ISIS-K, the people who mowed down 140 people in a Russian theater the other day saying our next target is the United States of America. And we're sitting around going, let's figure out what we can trade for the border. And I'm like, what what is going on? Like this to me is post 9-11. I find it reprehensible. It's yeah. borderline treasonous that you are watching people come in this country willy nilly who are throwing down their their papers, who are cutting through assaulting National Guard members. And we're like, well, you can sue them. Uh, we'll give you a, a, a gift card, a hotel room and a plane ticket to wherever you want. And I'm like, what what is literally I, I cannot believe how backwards our thinking is on this. I, if you don't support the border right now, what do you support? Because to me- right. well, but Sean, I, that's, I, that's the, so I, I get it. I get the frustration. I think everyone is. And, and I think this is another one when I talked about those disaffected liberals before, those are the people who are waking up to it now too. Don't forget, even RFK has had a real red pill moment during his campaign. Remember, he went to the border and he was like, holy crap, like I just met- people from 30 different countries in a half hour just walking right into America. So no, everyone knows that's not sustainable. That's one thing. The problem here also, it's not just that they combine these bills. So, okay, we'll fund border defense if we can fund Ukraine, which makes no sense. It's also that we don't need more funding to do it. We don't need more bills to do it. The president of the United States right now has every bit of authority to close the border period. He absolutely does. So you must then think he does not yes, want to do it. That's, no, that's exactly. It. You know, that's, see, I, I cannot, I, I'm so tired of fighting with people when I say it's, it's, he has every authority to do it. When 60 Minutes sends a camera to the border and shows how people have cut wire and are coming in, this isn't a legal port of entry, of which there are 28 in the state of Texas. This is like literally leaving your door open at night and saying, there's nothing I can do. What do you want me to do? I know Sean, people keep coming in the house. What do you want me to do? And you're like, close the front door. Sean, you mentioned the Russia theater thing from uh, attack from two weeks ago. I mean, I was in Israel uh, about three weeks ago for a week and I was down near the Gaza border and everything else. And I can tell you without uh, the slightest bit of daylight that every single Israeli, regardless of political party or religious belief or anything else, if they could go to the day before on October 6th and defend their border more clearly, they would do it. So we better damn well wake up to to what potentially is, is happening right now. I, I brought this up on the show the other day, and I don't mean to bring it up again, but I just I feel like I, I had a conversation on a panel. It's probably two months ago now. And I said, uh, and this Democrat said to me and the other Republican, you know, after big tragedies, 9-11, natural disasters, et cetera, we all come together as a country. And this is what he said. He said, I'm afraid that after, if, if something happens at the border, your side will blame Biden. And I said, you're right, we will, because he deserves it. Yeah, but, but, but not only will our side blame Biden because he does deserve it, but they will blame Trump. They're already blaming yeah. Trump. I mean, even if you listen to their rhetoric now, why didn't the bipartisan border deal get signed? It's because Trump didn't want Republicans to sign it. Now that may well be true. Trump didn't want people to sign it because he didn't want the Democrats to get a quote unquote win on the border, but that's irrelevant because you don't need a bipartisan border bill to close the border. Correct. Also, the, well, the bill sucked. I mean, so there's that. I mean, every, I love how suddenly in Washington, telling someone not to vote for something is somehow a sin. I'm like, wait a second. Isn't that like you, you, I, the next yeah. time the Republicans want something going, Joe Biden issued, well, they call him a SAP, a statement of administration policy. That's literally what the White House puts out every bill. And it either tells their, their side that they're for it or against it. That's literally what they do every bill. You wait for your party says, oh, the Biden administration issued a SAP. What does it want us to do? Vote yes on the budget, vote no on the budget. No one seems to care, but because it's a border bill that Biden sent up, Republicans are bad on this. I'm sorry, this is nuts. Uh, I, yeah. I just, it's because the media wants it, that's it. That is it, and the best thing we can do is explain to people that just because something is bipartisan doesn't mean it's good. 
And just because you don't vote for something doesn't mean you're bad. <laughs> right. And bipartisan meaning Langford. I mean, it wasn't like well, this was like 40 right, votes. Right. First, it means Langford, but bipartisan, bipartisan right. just means everyone's getting screwed, basically. Right. I mean, that's that's the new definition. And I get it. I mean, we've done it. I remember when I was on the Hill, you get one Democrat. We used to get like Jim Traficant from Ohio to vote with it. We'd be like, it was a bipartisan bill because one person voted for it. Yeah. Uh, Dave, um, real quick before you go, I just want you to weigh in on, on this. Do you think you've interviewed RFK, you, you, you in touch with a lot of these folks. Do you think there's going to be debates in the fall? No. No, really? there's no reason to have debates. And this was one of my concerns with Trump not debating when DeSantis was really pushing for it. I understand why it was tactically, why it tactically made sense, right? It looked like your path was there. There's no right. reason to get dinged up and all that. But it was just obvious to me that once Trump set that precedent, that Biden was just going to say, okay, I've got my reasons too. He's an insurrectionist. Yep. He's got federal indictments against him. And obviously everyone knows Biden can't debate this time. It's a miracle he could debate last time, but whatever drugs they've got him on, I don't think are as effective anymore. It's four years later. So I don't think there'll be any debates. And it's a, and it's a really damn shame to the backdrop of RFK because RFK if you had him on stage with the two of them, again, whether whether you love Trump right. or not, so I don't mean this as a, I really don't mean this as a knock to Trump. I'm just talking about it in the in the idea set of what America could be with more good voices out there. It would be a real distinction between these three people. And unfortunately, there's just there's literally no reason for Biden to debate. That's just the, the same tactical thing that Trump did to DeSantis is exactly what he's going to do to him, because who's going to say, you know what? I've decided Joe Biden's not going to debate. I'm not voting for Joe right. Biden. Nobody's going to say that. So it is what it is. And it's, and it's like, you know what? Eventually, Sean, if we don't have debates, why have interviews? And we won't have interviews. We won't well, have we debates. Don't. We won't have press conferences. And then guess what? We won't have elections. Well, and, you know what? I, I, no. We're on that path. Dave Rubin, always love the show. Uh, you definitely get all the good guests, which is probably, you know, uh, anyway, I, I, I'm, yeah. I'm in your, I'm in your wake. I'm in your wake. Um, hey, look, you got me. So that's huh, right. That's right. right. You interview right. the people that I interview you about interviewing. That's a great, that's a, what a great show. Uh, all right. Well, thank you for always being with us, folks. Thanks to Dave for joining us. Head into the weekend, knowing that we got a great show coming your way next week. A ton of great guests. Continue to share this, please. YouTube, Rumble, uh, Apple and Spotify. Make it great. Thanks for all you do. We'll see you back here on Monday on the Sean Spicer Show. Well, if you enjoyed this content, make sure to like this video, subscribe, and click the notification bell to get more.